Let's go to, uh, let's see here. I'm going to go back. Not to Little Demon. There we go. Deuteronomy 18. We'll go from there. And uh, y'all pray for Little Graceland. <clears throat> At this point, I don't know if it was just an accident she had or just pure meanness. But if she's got my blood in her, it could be just mean rottenness. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let me, let me do this. I love to see contrasts in the Bible. So in Deuteronomy 18, 9, he's going to list nine things here that he does not want God's people participating in. Uh, before we read that, I want you to look at verse 15. He's going to give you the opposite of what he wants out of the people of Israel. It's something better than witchcraft. Something better than witchcraft. Um, verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Now, what do you notice about that word prophet? It's capitalized. That means it's Christ. When the woman at the well said, are you that prophet? It's exactly who she was referring to. There's several places in the Bible where the Bible mentioned a specific prophet. Not by name, just a prophet. And here we have it capitalized by our King James translators. They got that right. Raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. In other words, he's going to come out of Israel. Of thy brethren... Like unto me, in other words, he's going to be, Moses is a foreshadowing of this prophet. Unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, uh, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. So, I mean, God here is talking about, again, this idea of a mediator between men and God. Because men heard God's voice at Mount Sinai and men said, we cannot listen to that voice ever again. That voice will kill us. Tell God, don't talk to us. Moses, you go hear what God said. You come tell us what God said. We'll believe that God said it. Because evidently you can bear it. We can't. Thus sets forth the idea of the mediator between God and men. Christ being that perfect mediator. And then he said, um, verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet again from among their brethren like unto me. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So obviously he's talking about Jesus. He's going to send forth Jesus, a prophet who is sort of similar to Moses. He's a lawgiver. He's the law bringer. He is the righteous judge over Israel. He's the leader over Israel. And so on and so on. And God says, I want to, whatever he says, I want you to understand those words I put in his mouth. So years later, Christ comes on the scene and every time he opens his mouth, the Jews say, well, that's blasphemy. We don't know where you're getting your doctrine, but obviously you're from Beelzebub. You're from the devil himself and we're not going to listen to you. So the Jews reacted in the exact opposite way that God told them to react. God told them that when he speaks, it's me speaking, you better listen to him. And the Jews said, we're not, we're not going to listen to him. So that kind of tells you who they are. So now, he promises us the prophet would come and speak in the name of God. God would take his words, put them in his mouth. He would come and speak them to us. And thus we have the words of our Bible. That are number one, 100% right. They're never wrong. Number two, it's given to us freely. Number three, I don't have to do some stupid ritual and sling incense and do all this nonsense and act stupid 
I'll show you some of the stuff they do. In order to get God's word to work. God's word is just like putting a seed or dropping a seed on the ground. If you just drop a seed on the ground, it'll grow. Roy, the best tomato plants I ever saw in my life was in our dog pen. They were uh, born again tomato seeds. Okay? We fed the dogs scraps we had off the table, just scraped it off in a bowl, mixed it with some dog food, and I took it down there and they ate it. And the next spring, all of a sudden, this vine came up and was growing up their dog pen wall, their dog pen fence. And they had the prettiest tomatoes on there. Ain't no way I was going to eat them, but they looked nice. Okay? Anyway, um, that's what God said. So the opposite is the things he tells us not to do. And again, he tells us that because he knows the devils that are behind this. He knows it's dangerous. So in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, like an astrologer, or an enchanter, someone who can... A chant is a repeated mantra or a prayer um, or some form of magic spell that when recited over and over and over again, um, those who believe and practice enchanting or enchantments believe that because of the repetitive nature of it, that it works. It works better than anything else. Okay, And Jesus has already knocked that doctrine down by saying, do not the way of the heathen. Okay, For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. If you got something to pray, pray it. Amen? Just pray it. Just ask God. God heard, God heard you. He knows how to answer it. <clears throat> but anyway, that's what an enchanter is. Or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, and he's talking about... This was the practices of the giants. The people that were in the land before the Israelites were the giants. This was their religion. This was their practices. And God said, I don't want to see that now. I'm driving these nations out because of that. And I'm not going to have my people coming in here figuring out what they did and start doing that. I won't have it. God said, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times, unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Let's go to prayer again. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. And we thank you, Father, for your word. And uh, <clears throat> Lord, I stand in opposition to everything that the devil does, that he teaches, that he promotes, that he very subtly draws people by their own lust and their own greed into. Father, there is absolutely no doubt, because I know what the Bible says, I believe this book, I see the types and shadows, I see men like Manasseh in this Bible, who was a king, and yet... He was probably one of the most occult-driven kings that Israel ever had. And Father, there is no doubt in my mind that we have leaders in Congress, in the courts, and the White House, on the state level, governors, mayors, congressmen, Father, that are nothing but witches, 
warlocks, wizards, diviners, necromancers, uh, astrologists, observers of times, baby killers. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. Because of this Bible, because of this book, it tells us who's really running the show in this country. Father, give us wisdom, give us patience, help us, dear God, to endure to the end. And Father, we magnify your word. I don't mean to magnify the devil. I want to magnify your word and show that it is far superior, far superior to anything the devil ever came up with. So bless your word tonight. Bless my family, bless our church, bless my grandchildren. And here we are, Father, fixing to leave. And this situation rises up. I just pray, God, Lord, that you would just watch over my family, please. I love you and I trust you. We ask for your blessings now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. We are we are planning or we're planning uh, to leave uh, this afternoon and at least get halfway there. And um, so just continue to pray for us. All right. Now, uh, last. I don't remember if it was last week, week before last. Um, I started right around or I finished right around in here. And I want you to notice this is what I would say the definition of witchcraft. It involves ritualism, rites. And again, I ask the question, are there any rituals spelled out for us in the scriptures? In other words, are there, let's say that, um, oh, let's say that J.R. here was, Looking for a nice young lady that would be sweet on him and love him and want to marry him. And she's a good Christian young lady and all this stuff. And J.R. Wanted, uh, wanted her to fall in love with him. So is there any ritual in the Bible that J.R. can do that would make... God make this woman fall in love with him. Now that doesn't mean there's no hope for you, Jr. Okay? It just means that ain't the way. Now, the, the funny part is, that's one of the things that witchcraft promises people. Is that you can learn love spells. You can learn love spells and you can recite them and they'll give you instructions on everything that you have to do. And there's some purchasing probably going to be involved because there's spices and just different kinds of things that they say you have to have in order for this spell to work. Now that's absolute pure garbage. That's nonsense. God doesn't care, ask us to bring a shaker of salt every time we get down on our knees to pray. Now throw the salt over your left shoulder, say Mother Mary three times, and then give your prayer, and then God will give it to you. Nothing like that in the Bible anywhere, is my point. But witchcraft, like a lot, in fact, most every mystery religion, cult, is like this. Religious ritualism. That seeks to produce supernatural results by means of invoking spiritual forces. In other words, these spirits won't do anything for you until you perform the ritual. You must perform the ritual. You must say the magic words. You must, um, you must, um, have the spell and read the spell or memorize the spell and get all the words right. Who remembers that show, Bewitched? You remember Aunt Clara on there? What was the deal with Aunt Clara? She was always getting the spells wrong, which, oh dear, oh, and all of a sudden there's a donkey in the middle of their house, okay? 
And the whole show would be about her trying to remember the real spell to undo the first spell to get the donkey out of the house. Okay? Believe it or not, that's witchcraft. You have to say the right words and you have to say the words right. You have to say them in the right fashion, in the right way. You have to speak them to the universe. You have to speak them to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. You have to awaken gently the dragons that are at those four corners. Those dragons, what are dragons? They're devils. And those dragons must be stirred and awakened so that you can invoke them and they will cause the power to be so that your wishes can come true, your dreams can come true, and whoever you want to fall in love with you will fall in love with you. That's the promises witchcraft makes. Now... Here's something that's interesting. It doesn't work every time. It doesn't work every time. God makes sure of it, I believe. Else, if it did work every time, there would be a real counterfeit religion that has the same results as Bible Christianity. And God will not let anything compete with His glory. His record. Amen? Here as on God's side, does God answer every prayer? Yes. Yes, He does. He answers every prayer. Does the devil? No. Because remember, sometimes he's asleep. I, I might show you that in a little bit. Anyway, religious ritualism. We do not, we do not practice rituals, rites. We do not read sacred prayers. We do not invoke the Holy Spirit. We do not, I do not have the power nor the ability to say to you in this church, thy sins be forgiven thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and all your sins now are forgiven by God. I do not have that power. That's witchcraft. It's exactly what it is. Now, here is from a website, spellsandmagic.com. What does it mean to be a Wiccan? Remember the word Wicca, witchcraft, wizard? That all comes from the same derivation, the word wist. In, in English means it's related to the word wise and it describes people who supposedly have an advanced knowledge that other people don't have. What does it mean to be Wiccan? To be Wiccan is to worship the goddess and her companion, the horned god. So can you be, just on that right there alone, if we stopped right here, and I said, is Wicca compatible with Christianity? What's the answer? Why? Tell me why. Tell me why. You're not getting by with no. Do what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's that simple. If Wicca says to be a Wiccan is to worship the goddess and her companion, the horn god. Notice that the goddess female in this statement is put on an even keel with the horned god, the male horned god. They are seen as being equals. One is not above the other. In witchcraft, the female witches won't have it. Okay, they won't have it. So they are her. It is her and her co-companion. They are equals, and to follow the philosophies, ethics, and practices of the old religion. What does she mean by that? Turn to Genesis three. Genesis 3. Here, 
In Genesis 3 is where I believe Satan introduced the idea of witchcraft or the old religion, the alternate religion. Okay? Um, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. A direct contradiction of what God said. And then he said, For God doth know. Now he's going to introduce to the world a secret doctrine that he says God knows it. God just doesn't want you to have it and he doesn't want you to know it. Who in here knows who Prometheus was? Who is Prometheus? Anybody study mythology? Let's see, that would be Greek. Prometheus. Prometheus was a, a, um, a lesser god. And he saw that the gods in heaven had fire. But poor man on the earth didn't. Man didn't have the ability to heat his cave up to heat his tent up, heat his home, cook his food, boil his water, give light in the darkness. Man didn't have any ability to do that. Prometheus said, well, I'm going to, I don't think that's fair. I'm going to ascend up to heaven and I'm going to steal their fire and I'm going to bring it down to the earth and give it to humanity so that humanity can have the same power that the gods have. Does that sound familiar now? The devil just said something similar to that. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods. The fire in that story represents this occult knowledge. Okay? Like the, the fire in this case is not necessarily related to burning things. It's related to lighting your way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A candle has a flame on it. And we use that for light. And so the idea of Prometheus was he wasn't bringing fire so much down from heaven and giving it to man as he is sort of a fourth cousin, eight times removed from the devil here, who says, I have God's real secret doctrine and I'm going to be the one that gives it to mankind because God doesn't want man to have it. God doesn't want man to be like God, and so I'm going to give this thing over to man. I'm going to give the power that the gods have, I'm going to give that to man. And so that's where that, and that's why they call it the old religion. Is that it does, it goes all the way back, I believe, to the Garden of Eden. But there is a religion that in my Bible is at least one chapter older than the devil's religion. How is she? Okay. okay. Uh, anyway, I know a religion that's at least one chapter older than the devil's religion. And that's in Genesis 2, where God tells Adam, I'm giving you the tree of life, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it, um, you shall surely die. So here we have... A blessing from God, the tree of life, and a restriction from God, the commandment not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that religion's older than the devil's religion. But anyway, so they practiced the old religion, originally rooted in paganism. Wicca existed long before Christianity. 
but not long before God. And long before the church was founded, but not long before Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve came first. Wiccans honor the earth as their spiritual mother, the goddess. I had a pastor the other day ask me, um, what goddess was it that was a goddess of fornication? And I wrote him back and I said, all of them. <laughs> okay? Whether it was Ashtaroth, mentioned in the Old Testament. Diana, mentioned in the book of Acts. Um, Gaia. The, uh, the earth goddess. All of these female goddesses are fertility goddesses. They deal with the idea of fertility and the ability for living creatures on this earth to procreate and reproduce their own kind. And the pra I won't get into that. I won't get into the practices they do. But anyway, if, if they're goddesses of fornication, that's what they do. So Wiccans honored the earth as their spiritual mother, the goddess and the sky. And by the way, Al Gore, who in 2000 promoted himself as one of these good Tennessee Baptist guys. No way, no how. He was just trying to appeal to the conservative Christian vote in this country to get elected. By the year 2000, Al Gore had already written a book about the environmentalist movement and about how big corporations and big business and all the cars and mankind itself was destroying the planet and we need new laws and new ways of, of bringing energy to people, clean energy, and we need to cut off man's carbon footprint and we need to do... And by the way, he had already invested in dozens of companies that were going to get government contracts to impose the EPA's new demands on clean air and all that stuff. He had already invested in those companies and stood to rake in millions of dollars had he become president in the year 2000. Okay? So he lost and we got a big oil guy. You make of that what you will. But anyway, Wiccans honored the earth as their spiritual mother, Gaia, the goddess, and the sky, and the wildness of nature as their spiritual father, which they call the horned god. Here are some images of them. You have the goddess, you have the horned god. Now take your Bible, turn to Revelation. 13. Let's see who this horned God is. He is the God of the woods, the beast of the woods. Matthew, he's the wild man of the woods. Okay. Which is a uh, Another term for Bigfoot. Okay. Um, I got another picture to show you. Here you go. How about that one? The horned God, the goat. <clears throat> so in Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. So that shows authority. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. There's some name, I don't know what it is. I bet you it's in the Bible. But there's a certain name that he must be wearing on his heads. That to wear that name on his head is absolute blasphemy. 
So, um, the horned God, let's go back here, is none other than the beast. Turn to Revelation 17. You'll actually see the two together here. Revelation 17, and there came one of the seven angels, verse 1, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Um, I thought about going that way this morning with the message. Because the drunken spirit that I refer to is Mystery Babylon, the great. That's her. Um, the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman, here it is. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, a red beast. Full of names of blasphemy. That's what we just saw in Revelation 13. Having seven heads, ten horns. That's what we saw in, in uh, Revelation 13. So, Matthew, the beast is a ten-point buck. Okay? And he has set Now, I don't know if he has ten horns per head. That would be 70 horns. I think that would get you in the record book. If you killed a 70 point buck in Missouri, but he has seven heads and 10 horns and this beast and this woman are united together. When a woman, let's say a woman sits on a horse, who's, who's doing what? Who's in charge? The woman is, she's got the reins. She dictates wherever she wants the beast to go, and that's where he goes. You have a picture of that with Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. Naboth just put his foot down and said, I'm not selling you my vineyard. I'm not giving it to you. I'm not trading it for anything. If you think you got a better vineyard than I do, then you enjoy your vineyard, I enjoy mine. But it's, God forbid it, I sell it under thee. It's, it's against the law. Jezebel comes in, sees Ahab sitting in a corner sucking his thumb like a little kid. So what's the matter with you? Grow up. And he says, Naboth won't let me have his vineyard. And she said, are you not king over Israel? Stand up. Comb your hair. Wash your face. Go in and eat. I will get you Naboth's vineyard. That's her job. To steal what doesn't belong to her and give them over to the devil. How many good Christian church parents have lost their children to the devil? A lot. A lot. How did that happen? The goddess, Gaia, Ashtaroth, Diana, Mystery Babylon, Jezebel, stole them for the devil. Says, I'll get them for you. And her with her cup of the wine of her fornication. When I was in high school, there were two big things that practically most of the kids my age in high school had already been well versed in. Number one was drinking. Number two was fornication. Most by the time I got to be a senior, most of the kids I went to school with had already been drunk multiple times. 
Because I used to hear them come in and talk about it every, every Monday. You'd hear them talk about their weekend. Talk about where they, what party they went to, where they got drunk, whose bed they ended up in. I had to listen to during prom time. This, I was never, I never went to any school dances, didn't go to the prom, nothing. I used to hear these people who talked about when they went to the prom, several of them, several of their parents already reserved a room for them in the same hotel for after the prom. And they bragged about that. So by the time these children are 18 years old, they're already well versed in, um, in you're in Revelation 17, um, in verse 4, she has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And it says um, in verse 2 that she has made the inhabitants of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. The two things usually go hand in hand. Okay? There, in other words, there's a lot of gay bars. There are no gay libraries. You get what I'm saying? Okay? They don't go to libraries to look for guys to hook up with. They go to bars to do it. Couples do the same thing. They don't go to the library to look for women. They go to the bar to look for women. Get them half drunk. Get them all the way drunk. Doesn't matter. You've got the same thing. And then you have God over in Jeremiah 51 saying, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. What that means, I've, I've explained this many times, what that means is God just pours out that cup of drunkenness on people who want it. People who want it. You want to live the life of a drunk? Here you go. Here's your first drink. You want to live the life of a drug addict? Here you go. Here's your first shot. Here's your first... Marijuana cigarette, here's your first whatever. And I'll just let the rest take care of the rest. And that's usually how it's done. Won't most drug dealers, when they find somebody new, give them the first one for free? Let them sample the goods, and then once they've been high once, they'll steal everything they can from their own parents just to keep getting high again. And witchcraft, that whole spirit is a part of this. It absolutely is a part of this. Here, what you see on your right, your left. What you see on your left is, is actually a museum of witchcraft in, I think this is Cornwall, England. And they have this statue sitting up on a throne on a throne, the body of a human, the head of a long-bearded goat. Now let's take that idea of a goat and let's apply it to scriptures. Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. The right hand is where the book is. The right hand is where Christ is. The goats are on the left. And what group out of the two groups, where do the goats spend eternity? Yeah, everlasting punishment, the Bible says. While the sheep spend eternity with Jesus. Okay? With the shepherd. Uh, symbolism of a goat. When uh, Roman Polanski, one of the weirdest, wickedest Hollywood film producers and directors that there ever was, 
when he made the movie Rosemary's Baby, he literally used the imagery of a goat that impregnated Rosemary. She thought she was dreaming and impregnated Rosemary. You understand the idea of Rosemary? Who was the mother of Christ? Who was the mother of Christ? Mary, thank you. So they named her Rose Mary. Because who's she giving birth to? Anti-Christ. Thou child of the devil. Okay? Um, let's see here. It's almost quarter after. We got to get, I think, I don't, I don't know if we're still leaving today or not, but we'll find out. Anyway, let's stand to our feet. I hate to leave on a note like that, but let's stand on our feet. You folks pray for our family. Pray for my grandchildren. Pray for us this week as we go to Indiana. That God would bring forth uh, the fruit of our labor up there. God would bless our trip, give us safety, and uh, use us for his kingdom, his glory. Remember to pray for Michael, pray for Noah. Uh, Jackson came up this morning. I hope he was telling me the truth. He said, um, can, can, I, can I get a piece of candy for me and then get um, one for Noah? I said, yeah. But it didn't occur to me that maybe he'll eat Noah's on the way up there. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, Rose's brother's not doing well at all. And you, they found something in his lungs. A mass, okay. So we'll pray for him. And just lift one another up, okay? Pray for our church. We love you folks online. We pray for you. You pray for us, okay? Father, I love you. And I thank you, God, for all you've done. And Lord, I, I get it. Um, anytime I'm going to go against the devil head on, go right to the heart of who he is, what his religion is, how he works, exposing him for what he is, is always a distraction, there's always chaos, there's always disorder. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless my family. Watch over them this week. Bless this church. Watch over them. Give them physical and spiritual protection. We thank you, Lord, for all of those families that join with us online. Pray that you'd bless them and watch over them and keep them safe. Father, I hate the devil. I hate him. I hate everything about him. I hate what he does. I hate what he tries to do to me, what he's tried to do to me, what he has done to my family, what he will try to do to my family, what he's done to my church, what he will try to do to my church. I hate every bit of it. And Father, I'm asking you, Lord, to bless my people and watch over us. Help us to be mindful of the days that we live in and help us to be mindful, Lord, of the work that we do, that you've given us. If the enemy can knock out the watchman, he has a lot better chance of taking the city. So, Father, Lord, would you bless your people this week? Watch over us all and give us grace, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.